Hello, everyone. I'm not taking this lesson alone. I've got my panel. <laughs> so we can all stand, can't we, panel? Let's, let's, oh. I normally see a table, but. Okay. Yeah, I think we can. Okay. So as um, Elder Cassidy is um, three, um, as Elder Cassidy is preparing the chairs, I will just introduce the book to us today. Uh, it's been a long time since I taught a lesson that introduces the chapter. So it's, you sort of have to talk about what it talks about. <laughs> so I'm just going to go to our lesson today. I'll just do this part whilst the panel comes up. Okay. So it talks about the book of the covenant, Deuteronomy. Somebody said, I wish that they had found a shorter name because I still can't pronounce it or spell it properly. But I hope you know I mean this book. <laughs> I'm going to call it Deuteronomy today. So there's an interesting story that is told of King Josiah. It says, whilst one of his people were either in the temple, they picked up this book with this chapter, and they brought it to the king. And the king, when he read the book, he rent his clothes. And he started crying. And it said, from this book, reformation started. From this book, revival started. And I'm thinking to us today, I hope when we are done with reading Deuteronomy or with this lesson, reformation and revival will be brought in the house of the Lord. Amen. So this is, then Josiah looked at what was it? that the book was talking about. And I think that's Deuteronomy 28, where they, he then discovered that they had moved away from what God had planned for them. They had moved away from the covenant with the Lord. And so he brought Israel together so that they could go back to where they wanted, or God wanted them to be. And it also talks about... Um, like I said, this is the introduction of a new book. So it talks about why Deuteronomy, why was this book written? And it said Moses wrote this book because he wanted to remind that generation of the covenant that, they had, that the Lord had done with the children of Israel. And we are reminded that by the time the book was written, most of the people who had had the covenant with God had perished in the wilderness. So it was um, necessary before Moses left that he reminded this new generation of the covenant that God had made with their forefathers. And from there, I see the love of God in that he just didn't want to put the sins of the fathers or the ignorance of the fathers, but he took time to remind this new Israel through Deuteronomy, his covenant with their forefathers. Amen. Isn't it a great lesson? So this is what we're going to learn throughout the book of Deuteronomy as we study um, the, 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 the chapters. And also... It talks about the book being history. So it brings the history of the children of Israel 
into reality for that new generation that was about to cross the promised land. And it also talks about the covenant which God had made with their forefathers. It also talks about love. The book of Deuteronomy, how God loved them and that he carried them on his wings like an um, eagle, yeah, from Pharaoh's clutches into a new land. So this is a beautiful book, and I'm hoping that as we read this book throughout the month or throughout the months to come, the three months, reformation will be brought in the church of God as was with King Josiah. Amen. Now I'll join my panel as we move to Sunday. Um, sister, sister um, facilitator, I just probably want to mention a point or two on the book of uh, Deuteronomy. Um, Deut Deuteronomy is really the second law. Um, the first was um, Leviticus. Leviticus was written where, where um, by had all of these rules and regulations. But these rules and regulations, if you look at the difference between Deuteronomy and, and Leviticus, is that Leviticus focuses attention largely on the activities of Israel and their conduct while they were in the wilderness. So if you read Leviticus carefully, you will see that a number of the laws and rules and regulations were related to activities associated with wilderness nomadic type life. However, the book of Deuteronomy was written in a different way, even though it had also these rules, regulations, and how Israel should conduct itself while, but this time it was while they were now occupying the land of Canaan. So the, the book was written to give like um, a constitution for the nation of Israel when it was set up in the land of Canaan. That was the purpose of, of Moses writing that book. So there is a slight difference between um, Leviticus, the first law, and the second law um, of, of, of Deuteronomy. And remember, Deuteronomy was intended to be a fulfillment of the promise that God made to Abraham that he is going to take him out and set him up in this land and, 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 and so forth. And, and, and that promise was fulfilled when the children of Israel entered Canaan. And Deuteronomy was to be the guiding star for the nation of Israel when they entered Canaan. They forgot about the book. They do their own thing and so on until it was found according to our world leader. Thank you. You can hear me? Yes. Fantastic. So if you look at Saturday, it talks about the preamble to Deuteronomy. So it means there is something that we need to know or to contextualize before we can understand the book of Deuteronomy. When you looked at this during the course of the week, what is it that you found in this lesson that we need to know or we need to contextualize so that we can fully understand the book of Deuteronomy? Sister Audrey. Well, um, we need to see, look at the history that led to this book being written, as you say, in context. And so we are going to look at things like God himself, you know, who God is, when he created the world, what happened, what happened in heaven, what happened leading up to the call of Abraham and for Jesus Christ to come. And before we, this is a history that we have to look at so that it can lead us into an understanding of why the book of Deuteronomy was written. Until we know all these preambles that led up to the book, then we can understand it and we can extract the present truth from it to apply to us today. Amen. Yeah. Amen. Anybody from the congregation who wants to add? All right. So let's move on to Sunday. It says, love to be loved. And we read our memory verse, which is 1 John 4, mm -hmm. verse 8. It says, he who does not love does not know God, 
for God love. is love. love. And the author says, it doesn't say God will love mm -hmm. or God loved or God is capable of loving or God manifests love. But it says God is love. So there's no other description that describes love except God. So they are, they, they, they are equal. When you look at God, you look at the love. meaning of love itself. There is no other meaning apart from God. So there is no other love that we can give apart from godly love. Any other love is not love as long as it is not godly or God oriented. What do you think, Elder? And please let us feel free to uh, come up and say something. Sister Sheru, can I ask you to check if there's anything online? Thank you. This text uh, worried me a bit and the, uh, while I was studying this week. Um, um, and um, it says that and, and, the, and the author of the lesson suggests that love seemed to be the essence of who God is. And that worried me a bit because I under, from my experience with love, love is something that is manifested in a particular relationship. So I, I cannot have love in isolation unless I'm involved in some sort of relationship. Uh, it, is, it, is, it, is, it is that which shows that love can be manifested. Outside of that relationship, there is, there is no love. And uh, uh, why it worried me is because if love is the essence of God, and God existed before any of his creation, that is, he is eternally in the past, in what sort of a relationship would have this love be manifested? Could God, could the essence of God truly be love if there is no relationship for which this love can be expressed? If you understand what I mean. I can understand God expressing love once he began the process of creation. And I'm not only talking about the creation of man. I'm talking about the creation of angels. Once of angels also. Once God began to create, there were objects or, or, or other beings to which God can express this love. But God existed prior. And, and therefore, how could that be the essence of, of, of love? And, and, and that concerned me a bit. And I looked at the text again and again and again. And I thought that this text is not telling us, so, in my opinion, so much about God as it is telling us about who we are. If we see the text again, it says, um, He who does not love does not know God, for God is love. The text is not intended to tell us so much about the essence of God because it's difficult for any of us to capture the true essence of God. It's telling us about us and what we should be that if we do not love, we cannot know God. So it is more about our behavior rather than the behavior of God. I thought that that is what the text was saying that it is a message to us much more than a message about God. Yes. I mean... <laughs> yeah, but we need to know, too, that God is love before we can love. Because um, I understand what you are saying, but when we look at creation and everything that has been created in the universe, love is manifested or is portrayed what God is all about in his creation. The creation in creating us as to have relationships with him creating the angels to have relationship with him because you say there's no love without relations, but God is different. God, you know, we can't equate ourselves with love. Maybe God doesn't need a relationship like how we do it. You know, we don't know, you know. So, yeah. So that's how, you know, I think I've, I've seen it. Mm -hmm. Yes, Elder. Um, do I understand what you're saying about a relationship? I think what we have to understand is that all things was created because of the love of God. God himself was love. And because of that love, all things was created. Yes. Um, 
I think the question is redundant um, for what Leslie, what Leslie's saying. Um, there are three separate beings in the Godhead, yeah. God, Father, and Holy Spirit, so they can have relationship with him themselves if, if that's mm -hmm. where he wants to go with that. And I think there's something really interesting that is just down um, in, the, in the chapter where it says, God took a risk when he made men. Yeah? Because he gave men the choice. He knew that men could either love him or not love him. But that didn't bother him or stop him from making men. Because even up to now, there's men who don't love God. But God still loves them. So that is the powerful. I think that just shows how much God is love. Yeah. In that he didn't mind what was going to happen. He didn't mind if this was going to be reciprocal. But he loved us anyway. Yes, Elder Kid. I think we, um, we struggle, we struggle uh, tremendously when we come on to... Um, um, using our own understanding and our language to, um, to describe God. To suggest, in fact, let me just, let me just say, um, where there is an element of risk, it means, that, it means that the outcome is not known. And if we are suggesting that God took a risk, and I've seen it here in the lesson, and I, um, I circle it, and I said, this is crazy. Because if we are suggesting that there are elements um, in, uh, that exist in our world that God did not know, then we are limiting the power of God. And so I concluded to myself that this is nonsense. Why? Because God knows everything. He knows everything. And so he knew that man was going to sin. He knew that man was going to sin. And so, and so there, is no, there is no element of surprise when it comes on to God. There is no risk. And so I took issue with this, with this bit. Amen. I do agree with you, Elder. But I think, like you say, words are very limited in our, 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 our dictionary or our diary. But I think what this man was trying to say is that God knew that there will be people who don't love him, but he still made men anyway. Yeah. It might be a matter of semantics, what words we use, but I think that's, it, that's the issue, that God still gave us choice, mm. knowing that we, men will sometimes not use that choice properly and follow him. But he did make men anyway, mm. and he did not impose on us to love him, to obey him, no, he didn't. He gave us the choice. But I think that's where, with our limited yeah. language, you would maybe use the word. Yeah. And risk. just one point, Sister um, Florence, too. Mm. It's not only when he made man, he took the risk. Mm. Even when he created the angels, it was a risk because they had moral freedom, you see. And that's why Lucifer, Lucifer, um, Lucifer, Lucifer um, sin because he had moral freedom. He was, he was um, created with the ability to love, okay, and he chose not to love, you know. Okay, let's, let's forget about the word risk. I think we all understand what yeah, well, the well, risk. The all saying. you knew, I should yeah. say. I don't know, how, yes, I don't know what um, other word to use except exactly. risk. Exactly. Elder Essen, please. Yes. <laughs> I never know. Use the mic, please. That the second of October will be here. Mm. But I'd rather have here the second of October. I want to tell you the reason why. It's about four weeks ago, the same panel there, I asked a question, and they never answered it. And more than all, many of them laugh after me for that question I asked. Thank God the second of February came. The second of October. And I want to tell you the question I did ask. How many creation God do and how many pre-creation? I don't think anybody remember that question I asked. <coughs> Thank God. This is Monday coming. You could read it for yourself. 
that there is a pre-creation. And what does the pre-creation mean? It's in the lesson here at the second paragraph at the last part. If you count five lines down and begin from the, on the middle line. The flood, the entire world was demolished. The flood, covered with water, as it was from the beginning. Man have a chance to make a second chance of recreation. Read it here in Oh, I glad I see such a lie laugh, such a recreation. God give chance. I'm glad I hear that word loaded up there about chance. God give man chance. Why? To take chance. Man never made to sin. Although we know that God knows from the end before the beginning. Man never made to sin. He's a perfect God who make a perfect man. But because man disobeyed, just one little data come on. Don't eat. Only that. Don't eat. And we find out, both in Adam and Jesus, the temptation first in them is food. Eat. If it is, if it is not God, turn his stone into bread. Food I first thing. And with the, 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 in Eve, it was food. Because it was look pleasant to the okay. eye. Okay, Brother Essen, thank, thank you very much. Thank you very much. Um, am I talking now? In, but but right. we, we've got to carry on with the lesson, please. And now we find in the lesson here this week, where we find that because of that, God did destroy the entire world and he gave man a second chance of a second creation. Read it for yourself. Amen. All right, thank you very much. Thank you, Brother Essen. And uh, although I was laughed after like a stupid, but thank God. I come here the second of October when this is the fourth of October it is written in the lesson. Okay. Thank you, Brother Essen. Let's um let's just continue. Oh, yes, Shall Sister I? Cheryl. Shall it is written in the lesson. Men have a second chance of creation. Okay, here's one. It says, um, if we get rid if we get rid of our own limited concepts of love and study love through and in God's terms. Love meaning is above our concept. Yes, quite difficult to understand what that would mean. Uh, 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 but I think that uh, uh, my other panelist, Sister Audrey, mentioned something um, um, earlier on about, and, and I think the author of the quarterly alluded to freedom of choice and that you choose to love. Um, I started reflecting over this week all those relationships that I'm involved in and how I loved. And I thought first about myself. Did I have a choice in loving myself? I think I had no choice. Did I have a choice in loving my parents? No, I just loved my parents. I didn't choose to love them. When I saw my, 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 my child, my first child, for the first time, I was overwhelmed with this love for her. I did not pause and think, should I love this child or not, that I was making a choice to love the child. For those of us who have got children, you don't choose to love your children. You just love your children. Okay, Even my relationship with my wife, I might have chosen her as my wife, but I couldn't think that at some point I made a decision to love her. Florence, you're a good-looking woman. I can't wake up tomorrow morning and say, I'm going to choose to love you the way I love my wife. That's not a choice I've got. So love is not necessarily something that we choose. Our freedom to choose is not what dictates our love. We, it is a, love is a very complex thing, and it is not based upon our choices. We just love. We might choose to follow God, but it's only when we enter into a relationship with God and we begin to associate with him that we develop a love for him. The love, is not as a, the, 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 the love doesn't come as a result of choice. Our freedom to choose does not dictate how we love, at least not in the sort of love relationships that we have as human beings. I think sometimes when we have experienced the mercies and the grace of God, we sort of forget what is out there. There is people who choose not to love people out there. 
There's people who choose to kill their children out there. There's children who choose to kill their parents out there. But we are here encompassed by the grace of God who has opened our eyes to see his love that we probably think there isn't hate out there. But it's full. It's there. People make choices. We were talking about um, the news is full of, uh, what's his name, cousins. He had a wife. But he left, left his wife and he went and he killed the girl. You know, so people are making evil choices. And that just shows that without the love of Christ within us, we make bad choices. Yes, Sister Cheryl. This one's from Juliet. She says, to love and be loved, be loved is embedded in all our hearts by God who created us. Mm. Yes. Amen. And one thing, Sister, Sister Florence, God created us to love him yes. because he wants to be loved to develop a relationship um, yes. with him. Mm. However, he does not force us to love him. Mm. Right? We, um, choo we can choose to love because if he forces us to love him, it's like he has program programmed us to love yes. and he doesn't want that. Mm. He doesn't want that. Mm. We have a choice. Fantastic. There's a question that is on Friday. Yes, Sister Ruth, as you come, I think that you'll be our last. Uh, yeah. Happy Sabbath, everybody. It's happy to be in the house of God. Now here, when we talk of love, God's government operates by love. And that's all we know. And... The Ten Commandments are written in the sheet of things and are full of promises. So we have to rely on them and keep them as how they go with us. Okay, Elder Paul. <laughs> Good morning. Um, love is a divine principle and sin costs eight to exist in the world. And I say that God created us with free will as free moral agent to exercise our own choices. We're not robots. And our choice should be dictated by the understanding that we have of who God is. Once we understand who he is, then love flows. Amen. Let's move on to Monday. You can't, um, Okay. She'll be the last one and we move to Monday. <laughs> I'm going to be the last one. Good morning, everybody. Uh, I think we have to understand here that God is everything. God is you. God is me. God is everything in the sense that he created us in his image. Our emotions, God has got emotions. You know, the attributes of God, we are all embedded with them. It's how you reflect how it is on yourself. Because you're all created in his image. So God is everything. That's how I can put it. Thank you. So we move on to Monday. It says the fall and the flood. And it talks a bit about science um, with, um, with uh, uh, what's his name, Newton, of how he, he revealed what was already known. You know, the, it, it's not like he, I think when we, we, we look at it, we we act as if he created gravity. But he just formalized. revealed or made clear, formalized. formalized what was known already. And the author says people were falling uh, before Newton was born. People were tripping and falling. Things were falling from the air. The balls were still being thrown. But by the time Newton came, he contextualized it and put it into context. So when we read this, it talks about, there's a uh, part I like here where it talks about, if I can find it, uh, where it talks about the, the, the moral law, that the moral law is just as valid as the natural law of gravity. So loving or, you know, the, the good things that we've been talking about are just as valid or as important or as 
as clear as the natural law, only that when we do not love, probably we don't see the results of it immediately. Whereas if I throw the ball up in the air, it's just going to come down very quickly. And we can see that. So it talks about the moral laws and how God um, made sure that as human beings, by bringing the commandments, we keep the moral law and it, it brings that relationship on us. And talks about when he talks about do not have, um, do not make, uh, do not commit adultery. It's, it's emphasizing love because if you don't commit adultery, you're creating that love relationship between you, your wife, and your children. If you do not steal, you are creating that relationship between your neighbor because you value and you respect their assets. So you don't go uh, stealing them. If you um, don't, if you're not rude to the other person, it means you value them as an individual. So these moral laws are equally as visible or as important as the natural law. I don't know how you understood it, Elder and Sister Audrey. Yes, how I understand it from reading it is that with the, um, what uh, Newton discovered, he discovered that gravity held the world in space the way the Earth and the other planets orbit the sun. So this natural law um, is related to the whole universe, basically, the, the whole solar system, right, where gravity holds everything in place. So with the moral law, moral law rules heaven mm -hmm. in God's, in heaven, and it also the same on earth. You see, the same law applies to the, um, I would say, the, the, the people, the inhabitants of heaven is the same law applied to us. So, and we have the same freedom to choose, you know, bad or good. And so in heaven, what Lucifer did, he incited rebellion and he chose wrong. Down here, you come down, you have Adam and Eve. What did they do? They choose to do, to choose to do wrong. But you have that law of freedom up there to choose and law of freedom down here to choose as well. That's how I understand it. Uh, I think that the relationship that we see here between the, nat the, 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 the difference between the natural mm -hmm. laws and the law and the moral law is that natural laws in general at the basic level cannot be broken. If you, if you jump off the roof, you're going to fall because of gravity. Th things are going to happen in these, these natural laws. Uh, I, I think they're now beginning to discover the quantum level. Things don't always operate the same way. However, natural laws, you, you, you have no choice in relation to whether they would operate or not. They just operate. Mm -hmm. But in moral law, we are given the option as to whether we should obey or not. We can choose to obey these moral laws. And, and that is why the memory text is so important. For you, to, when you, for you to choose to obey these moral laws, you have got to first love. Yes. Um, it is love that motivates you to obey these moral laws. It is love that is going to tell me I should not covet my neighbor's wife. It is, my, it is love that is going to motivate me to say I should not kill or to steal. So... And, and, and those who love that way will respond favorably to the moral laws. So, um, um, and then is where your choice comes in. You've got to choose to obey the law. The law is not like natural laws that cannot be broken. Yes, you can break them. You have a choice to, to do that. And it is the love that tells you that I'm going to obey it. The moral law, the commandments, just reinforces God's, lo God's love for mankind. And by reinforcing God's love for mankind, it draws man who understands towards loving God himself. Um, I, I don't think we necessarily keep God's law because we love, love people. I think some people keep God's law because... Um, they don't want to suffer the consequences of going to hell, or they, they follow God's, they follow the commandments. Like the Sadducees and Pharisees, they didn't love 
they didn't have love in themselves in particular, but they can keep the law. So keeping the law is not, doesn't show that you have love. It just shows that you're keeping the law. It can mean that you have love, but it's not, it's not by keeping the law, it doesn't, show, it doesn't show anything per se. Whatever's in your heart is in your heart, and you will do whatever you want to do. But just keeping the law is not showing love. No way. I, I think, I, I think that the, the word that uh, Neil has mentioned, keeping, is probably a, pro is probably a bit problematic. Uh, because um, Paul talked about being transformed by the renewing of your mind. So it is, even though you have chosen to follow God, you become transformed. And when you become transformed, then you respond in a certain way because you are a new creature. You understand? So it is not like making a decision to keep, to not kill. You understand? It's not just like making a decision to not kill. Not killing is a part of who you are. That's the transformation that Paul was talking about. So it is not, the word keeping is problematic. It is who you have become once you have entered into this relationship with Christ. You have become this different person. And this different person will not kill, will not steal, will not lie. I think it does speak to us as well. I think it was one of the quarterlies that we started a few months ago where it talked about legalism. So are you, how are you keeping the commandments or how are you keeping the law? Are you keeping the law just legalistic because you are afraid you go to prison if you kill somebody? You are afraid your wife will run away from you if you commit adultery? You are afraid this will happen? But if you keep the law because of love, that is a different issue. Amen. And I think that's where we aim to be as Christians, that the love of Christ constrains us Amen. to keep the law. That's right. Or to observe the law rather than being a legalistic. How many minutes have we got, sister, left? Don't tell me it's five. Oh, okay. <laughs> right. So let's quickly go to Tuesday, we're going to be really quick. Um, so Tuesday calls, uh, it, it, it's um, entitled The Call of Abraham. What did we understand? We're just going to be very brief because we don't have time. What do we understand by this chapter? What came to our minds when we read this, um, this, this day? The very gospel quickly. was always intended to be universal. It was never intended to just be for one particular group of people mm. at any given time. It was always supposed to be. The gospel was always universal in nature. So I think this is where it talks about the kingdom of priests. Mm -hmm. Or we, as a, we are a chosen generation, a royal priesthood. The reason why... Ten minutes, thank you. The reason why we are a kingdom of priests or we are a chosen generation is not that we should feel good about it ourselves. The reason why we are a remnant is not that we should feel like, yeah, we are the remnant. But we've actually been given a great commission that we go and share the good news about Christ. The good news about salvation with everybody. So it's, it, it is a privilege, yes, but it is also a responsibility that we are Christians today. It's not about us just living good lives, feeling good lives, but also that our lives will share that testimony to the world and the world will get to know. And that's why Israel was chosen. They were not chosen just because they would be Israel. And once we forget why we are a chosen generation, why if we forget why we are Israel today, then that's where we feel we are peculiar than everybody else and start treating everybody else anyhow. But if we remember that we are a nation of priesthood, we know priesthood are servants. So we are the servants of the people. We are the servants of Christ to share or to spread the gospel all over. So that what God had said 
with Abraham becomes fulfilled even in our lives today. Yes, Elder Paul. I think we have to um, restudy Genesis all over again. When God made us, there is no journey come lately to the salvation story. Gentiles mean those who has departed from the way of life. Because when um, Noah had his three sons and, and Shem was sh- chosen, was to bring back the next two brothers back into the, the family of God. We are once his by creation and twice by redemption. And so for God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son. So the gospel was first preached to Adam in Genesis 3.15 that he will send his son, the the seed of the woman, to redeem us. So therefore, salvation is for all humanity. The word Gentiles mean those who go astray. You were chosen to bring them back. Amen. Amen. Anybody else from the congregation? Yes, Elder. Just just a point here. When, When we are... When we choose to go against the principles of God, um, this is, um, if you like, this is us flipping the the natural order of things. Because when God created us, he created us in his likeness and in his image. That is to say, when we came from the creator's hand, we reflected the, the character of God. He placed within us love innately. He placed within us goodness innately. And so um, at that point in time, it was natural for us to do that which is good all the time. And, and so, and so to, to, to love now does not, does not mean we, um, we need a, a, a special push to be loved because it was innately a part of us. Um, and because the devil has done a job on us, um, we we have a problem, but I want you to know that as as um, as a people, as a people, God created us to reflect His image all the time, and He placed within us innately um, goodness, love, justice, and mercy uh, as 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 they are a part of being a part of God. I don't know, Elder Keith, whether it is natural because some of the characteristics you mentioned there are the fruit of the Spirit. So is it natural for us to have these characteristics or is it, does these characteristics come as a result of the presence of the Spirit? Because, because we have walked away from God. Because when God created us, we were perfect in every way. We lacked nothing. And so those, those elements were very much a part of us. But because the devil has done a job on us, we need uh, the power of the Holy Spirit to bring about a change, to bring us back to where God has placed us, has made us. Yeah. And, um, and from the lesson, from what I garner from the lesson, is that God makes us with the ability, with the ability to love. He makes us with the ability to love. And, 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 and the Bible history is, is not, it's not a mechanical thing of cause and effect. It's not a matter of cause and effect. The Lord said, you shall not. And throughout, throughout, throughout the history, throughout the history, the basis of the covenant God made with us, God moves and then we act. He tells us what we are to do. He, tell, he, 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 he pours his abiding love upon us. He acts. And then it's for us to respond to his love. Amen. Amen. Um, let's quickly move to Wednesday, a message from Thursday, if anybody So it says apostasy and punishment. That is on Thursday. 
So it talks about when, 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 when Moses spoke to the children of Israel, they said, whatever God says we will do, we will what? Do. We will do. But is that what the children of Israel did? No. They did the opposite, isn't it? Yes. They forgot the covenant. Mm -hmm. Whilst, sorry, sorry. Thank you, Sister Cheryl. They forgot the covenant whilst God kept his side of the covenant, the children of Israel decided they would not. And then they were reminded again, and they did say the same thing again. Whatever God says we will do, we will do. And I think whilst this, um, the, the, the author spoke about Deuteronomy as present truth, I think it's really important for us to reflect on what the children of Israel said and did and what we have said to God we will do and what we are doing. And this is how we bring this um, book into present truth. We, like the children of Israel, are on the borders of entering even a better land than Canaan. And so this book has come as a reminder to us in this generation. I love what God does. With Israel, he brought Deuteronomy. With us, he's brought today this quarterly for us to read about Deuteronomy and be reminded of our covenant with the Lord. And I am hoping, like I said before, by the time we finish with this lesson, like Josiah and his people, we will be reformed. And we will truly say with our hearts, whatever you say we will do, we will do. And we will mean what we are doing. May God bless us as we read this lovely but not so easy book. Thank you very much.